one at a time. Everybody gets one. <laughs> now, all of us are wondering the same thing. What does Alan have in his pocket? Like, what gift if you can break all the sticks? That's... That's why there's like chocolate or something. <laughs> uh, beloved, God's word for today is, is from Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And you can turn there, but before we read it, I need to prepare you and myself, to be quite honest, uh, because we're about to read one of the most difficult texts in the entire New Testament. This is certainly one of the most difficult things that our Lord Jesus tells us. Why is it so difficult? Well, because Jesus is going to explain to us the signs of the end of the age. This is his end times prophecy that he's going to give to us. Sometimes it's called the Olivet Discourse. This is the eschaton, the end. So this is an eschatological passage. Eschatology is the study of the end times. And the study of the end times is actually a very difficult subject in the Bible if you've ever tried to dig into it. Why is it difficult? Well, it's difficult because it's a purposefully obscure subject. When you read prophecy like Daniel, Ezekiel, even go to John's revelation at the end of the Bible, there's a lot of symbolism in there, isn't there? There's a lot of images and things that are cryptic. And so you read eschatology, and sometimes you're not given the whole picture. You're given a glimpse. You're given an image. And because it's obscure, the other thing that makes this subject kind of difficult is that there's so many different opinions about what this all means. In fact, in this very room, as many people there as there are, there are probably that many different opinions about how the end times are actually going to play out. It gets a little confusing. And to make matters worse, this particular prophecy from Jesus, this is one of the most difficult and confusing prophecies in the whole Bible. And why is that? Well, let, let me give you a little quick outline of it and, and pay close attention to this because it'll, it'll really help you as we go through the chapter. So what's going on here is four disciples come up to Jesus and they ask him a question. They tell him, Jesus, when is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem going to take place? That's what they ask him. He's been talking about the temple being destroyed. He just told them the temple's going to be destroyed. And they ask him, when is that going to happen? And then they say, and what are the signs that that's about to happen? And Jesus indulges them, and he gives them four different sets of signs for when this is going to happen. First, he tells them what's going to be happening in the world leading up to this temple to being destroyed. Then he tells them what's going to be happening to them leading up to the temple being destroyed. Then he tells them what the temple being destroyed is actually going to look like. He calls it a great tribulation. And then finally, he talks about after that, how there's going to be these cosmic signs in the heavens. Now get this. And they're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in power and glory to rescue all of the elect. Now, you might be listening to that and saying, John, I don't see the problem. That sounds kind of awesome. And I'm right with you. That does sound awesome. Except after all of that, you get to verse 30 in this passage. And in verse 30, Jesus says, after saying all of that, he says, Truly I say to you, this generation, meaning the guys he's talking to, will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, beloved, that one verse right there has led to so much speculation as to what exactly does that mean. There's different viewpoints. Is, is, is Jesus saying that generation like just those guys? Is he talking about us, this generation? Is he talking about both of us? And get this, if Jesus says all of these things take place, 
before the apostles pass away, well, does that mean even the coming of the Son of Man takes place? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Did Jesus already come back? Some people think he did. Do you see how this gets confusing? This, get, this becomes a very confusing subject. What's the correct viewpoint? What, what's the correct answer here? There's got to be one, right? I, I want to encourage you before we read this passage to not get too preoccupied. Sometimes we do this with this subject of eschatology. To not get too preoccupied with having the exact right answer. One day, we'll find out. <laughs> Amen? All right, one day, we're going to find out. But I, I really appreciate G.K. Chesterton's words when it comes to a passage like this. This is a great, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him. He said, The fool tries to fit the heavens inside of his head. He says, if you try to do that, your head will burst. But the wise man tries to put his head inside the heavens. Amen. I think that's very wise. So, and that's my suggestion for us today. Let's put our head inside the heavens for a little bit. We're going to do an overview of chapter 13. We're going to look at the whole chapter and do an overview of this one big teaching from Jesus. Now, perhaps one day we'll do a Bible study where we really dive into the whole subject of eschatology and really explore it because there's a lot there. But for now, what I want us to do is I want to let the words of Jesus kind of wash over us, the whole breadth of what he's saying wash over us. And let's approach Jesus' words with some humility that says, I might not totally understand everything going on here, but that doesn't make it any less glorious. Amen? We might, listen, you're not going to walk away from chapter 13 and say, no, I get it, okay? Because many a scholar walks away from this with very different opinions as to what it exactly means. But that's okay. That doesn't make it any less glorious. So let's read Mark chapter 13. We are going to read the whole chapter. If you'd like to sit, you may. If you want to stand for the reading, you may as well. But here we go, Mark chapter 13, starting at verse 1. And as he came out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. But these are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on his housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation 
as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord has not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now here's the final words from Jesus, verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, Stay awake. May God add his blessings to his holy word. Beloved, that's the word of the Lord. It's inerrant. It's infallible. And we probably don't understand all of it. But it's still the word of the Lord. And it's still good for us. Let's pray. Father, bless us right now with understanding. Give us uh, patience and a mind to grasp Uh, what you are saying to us. And Father, make us excited. Make us excited for our coming King who is coming again. God, give us peace. Give us assurance. And help me not to say anything foolish. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go back to the beginning of chapter 13. Are you ready? Here we go. So the backdrop for this whole thing, the setting, is obviously the what? It's the temple, right? Uh, This was the second temple of Israel. It it was in its 46th year of being built. It still isn't built yet. 46 years. That's a long time. Some of you have built houses, and you'll be like, is this going to last 46 years? This actually did last 46 years. It was one of the ancient wonders of the world, though. The, The stones were enormous for this temple. They were alabaster white, and it was built with these big, beautiful gold domes. Uh, People used to say that from a distance, it looked like a snow-capped mountain glittering with gold is what it looked like. And you would look at this, and you would think, this is never going to go away. This is going to last forever. And so the disciples are admiring it. They actually tell Jesus, look at this thing. And then Jesus says, one day, not one of these stones is going to be left on top of another. One day this whole thing is going to be destroyed. Now that must have been jarring for them to hear. So four of these guys, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they, they wait until Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives, and there's this like picturesque moment where they're looking from the Mount of Olives, looking at the temple. It must have been beautiful, but Mark emphasizes they're looking at the temple, and then they ask him, Well, when will these things be? What will be the signs when these things are about to be accomplished? Now, y'all are smart. When they say these things in context, what are they obviously talking about? The destruction of the temple. Because that's what he's been talking about. That's what they're looking at. 
Now, I have a question, though. Is that all that Jesus is talking about? Is that all that these signs are pointing to? Is that the only fulfillment that Jesus is talking about here? And that is the destruction of this temple. Well, here's where you get all the differing opinions. Okay, Here's where you get the multiple different eschatological views. Okay, uh, Personally, here's what I think. I don't think Jesus is just talking about the temple. I think he's talking about another fulfillment as well. Most prophecies in the Bible don't have one fulfillment. They have two. Most prophecies don't have one. They have, they have two. This is where we get this phrase. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, the now and the not yet. Have you ever heard that phrase? That, that's where we get that idea is that most prophecies don't just have one fulfillment. They have two. I'll give you an example. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, this beautiful messianic psalm. As I read some of it to you, you'll, you'll recognize it. King David is speaking. And he's talking about how he feels being surrounded by his enemies. This is what he says. He says, dogs surround me. Evildoers pierce my hands and my feet. This is King David speaking about himself. None of my bones are broken, but they laugh at me and they divide my garments and gamble for them. Now, was that true of King David when he said it? I think so. Probably in a very poetic fashion. But yeah, that's probably how David felt. But what is the more full, true fulfillment of those words? You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. When Jesus has his hands and his feet pierced and he's put on a cross, surrounded by his enemies, but they don't break his bones, but they do laugh at him and take off of his garment and they gamble for it at the foot of the cross. So when you think of of prophecy getting fulfilled, it's helpful to think of two hills. You have the one hill where the prophecy prophecy gets an immediate fulfillment for the people that hear it, right? But past that, there's another hill where that prophecy is going to get fulfilled even more fully sometime in the future. And I think personally, I think that's what you're seeing here in Mark chapter 13. I think Jesus is speaking of what's going to happen for that generation, those disciples hearing that in the first century, and the first hill of fulfillment for them that he's talking about is when Rome's going to surround Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and that happened in 70 AD. We know exactly when that happened. But there's another future fulfillment. There's another hill that Jesus is also talking about, and that's in the future for us. And, and what we look at is we see this, these 2,000 years of church history that we've had, these 2,000 years we've been living in. Sometimes we call it the church age. And all throughout that 2,000 years, here's what I want to show you today. All the signs that Jesus is talking about have been happening all throughout this 2,000 years. And it's all leading up to this one day when Jesus is going to what? He's going to come back. He's going to come back. Now, could I be wrong? Beloved, I'm not wrong about the gospel. I'm not wrong about God's word being the word of God. But I will admit to you fully, I could be wrong about this. Okay? Because this is one of those subjects where we can all love the Lord and we can all have differing opinions. But let's put our heads in the heavens for a moment. And let's follow through these four sets of signs. And then afterwards, you can be the judge. You can come up to me and tell me I'm wrong. And that's fine, okay? First set of signs that Jesus gives us is he tells us what's going to happen in the world. Verse 6, he says, Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will lead many astray. Now, there's a guy, if you've never read this, you should. There, there's a, a guy named Josephus. He it was a historian in the first century, a Jewish historian. He wrote this book called The Jewish Wars. At some point in every Christian's life, you should go read that book because it's a very helpful book that confirms a lot of the stuff that we hear about in Scripture and things like that. But Josephus actually tells us that during this time, there were lots of people claiming to be the Messiah. There were lots of people, even after Jesus, claiming to be Jesus. That was very, very common. We even see one of them in Acts chapter 13. If you go there and read later, Acts 13, there's a, a guy named si- uh, Bar... I was about to say Simon Barjona. There's a guy named Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus. And he's a false prophet. He, he comes in Acts 13 and he invokes the name of Jesus to try to give credibility to his teaching. But he's a total charlatan. 
Now that is a sign that Jesus gives for these disciples leading up to 70 AD. Before the destruction of Jerusalem, what are they going to see? They're going to see people claiming to be Jesus and leading people astray. Do we see people? Let's go to our hill of fulfillment for a second. Do we see people that ever claim to be Jesus and lead others astray? I did a Google search this week. Did you know right now there are seven men all around the world that have a huge following, all of them claiming to be Jesus? And they're all in, the weird thing is they're all in different parts of the world. I'm, I'm not kidding. There's a man named Alan Miller in Australia, claims to be the resurrected Jesus. Matayoshi Mitsuo in Tokyo also claims to be the resurrected Jesus. I thought that one was really funny. Henri Cristo in Brazil and four others. All of these men have fairly significant followings. All of these men are terribly leading people astray. And beloved, give it a goog. Give it a Google, okay? Look throughout history. Have there always been people claiming to be Jesus leading people astray? Yeah, yeah, there have been. Jesus also says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. That happened before 70 AD. In 40 AD, there was an emperor named Caligula. You ever heard of Caligula? Yeah, the most perverted man who ever lived, in my opinion. He tried to put a statue of himself in the temple. And in the actual temple, and this caused such an uproar that there was this huge rumor that a war was getting ready to break out. It didn't. In fact, the very next year, Caligula's advisors killed him. But in 64 AD, the, another emperor, Nero, starts persecuting Jews, starts persecuting the Christians, causes a huge uproar. He sets Rome on fire, blames it on the Christians. This causes a Jewish war to break out, and that leads to that hill of fulfillment, 70 A.D., when the temple gets destroyed. All right, now let's go back over to our hill of fulfillment. Can you think of one generation in the past 2,000 years that hasn't had wars and rumors of wars? Like, can you think of one? No. That's always been a constant, hasn't it? Jesus also says there's going to be earthquakes and famines. In the first century, there were a lot of famines. That was common. There were also some famous earthquakes. 63 AD, the, an earthquake in Pompeii, totally leveled Pompeii. Huge, magnificent earthquake. And again, that's just before 70 AD. Back to our hill of fulfillment. Do we ever hear of earthquakes? Earthquakes that cause tsunamis and all sorts of things like that? Do, do we ever hear of famines? There's a famine in South Sudan right now. We hear of earthquakes and famines all the time. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, these are just the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, these are indicators that something for sure is coming. All right, the next set of signs that he gives is all about the disciples themselves. What's going to happen in their lives? Look at verse 9. Just glance at verse 9. This is basically a summary of the book of Acts. This is a summary of what happens to the disciples right after Jesus dies and rises from the dead. I mean, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are brought before a Jewish council because they healed a beggar. In Acts chapter 5, all the apostles get beaten and arrested, right? In, in, uh, in Paul, the apostle Paul, he gets brought before a governor named Felix. He goes before a king named Agrippa. And even in Acts chapter 26, he even gets the opportunity to share the gospel and almost convert King Agrippa. I mean, that's, that's what happens. All that Jesus just mentioned there. And then, today, do we see Christians getting arrested? Do we see Christians suffering? Do, do, we, see, do we see Christians afraid to come to Christ because their family might kill them. Yeah. Our, our own Jenny Kuhn, one of our missionaries in, in Lebanon, she's told us, yeah, she meets Muslims all the time that convert to Christianity and say, I had to leave because otherwise they would have killed me. I mean, that's a common thing. And what does Jesus say? That's what's going to happen. Verse 10. Verse 10 is a little bit of a hiccup. Jesus says, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. 
Uh Uh-oh. Okay. 70 AD. Before 70 AD, did the gospel get proclaimed to all the nations? It doesn't seem like it. Except, listen to this. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 18. Listen to what Paul says. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. You know, when you look at the book of Acts, here's here's what the book of Acts is really about. The whole book of Acts is about the gospel going to who? All the nations, to everyone. It's not just for the Jews anymore, right? What's the opening scene of the book of Acts? The opening scene of the book of Acts is the disciples are given the gift of tongues and they begin to speak in every language of every person that's gathered at Pentecost. Then Peter, he starts preaching. Does he just preach to Jews? Who does he preach to? He also preaches to Gentiles. And he preaches to Samaritans. He preaches to everybody. And so here's what we could say. For the known world at that time, the gospel went out to all the nations before 70 AD. But let's go back to our hill of fulfillment. Has the gospel gone to every nation today? No, best estimate, there are 7,400 people groups in the world that still have not heard the gospel or they've only barely heard the gospel. That's about 3 billion people. That's that's a strange number because... When we, when we think of the size of the world, it's like 3 billion people haven't heard about what we talk about all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, beloved, think about this. Jesus says before, before these things uh, take place, what, what's, what's going to happen? The gospel is going to go out to all the nations. If our hill of fulfillment is the return of Jesus, then what should we be really concerned about? The gospel doing what? Going to all the nations. Amen? Amen. Here's the third set of signs, verses 14 through 23. Jesus describes the actual destruction of the temple. It's kind of grisly. He he says there's going to be a man, and he calls this man the abomination of desolation. That is quite the title. Men, if your wives ever call you the abomination of desolation, you done done something wrong, okay? Now, who is this guy? I mean, this is is one of those things where you have all the speculation as to who this is, but he's where he's not supposed to be. I think in context, that means he's in the temple. He's not supposed to be there. Jesus is quoting from Daniel chapter 9 through 12. Go back, read Daniel 9 through 12. You'll read all about this. Daniel gets a vision of a guy that's called an abomination and a desolator. And guess what that guy does? He puts an end to sacrificial offerings. He profanes the temple of God and puts an end to sacrificial offerings. Now, we've discussed before just how horrible the destruction of the temple was. What happened is Rome, 70 AD, they surround the temple and they basically starve out Jerusalem. They, they surround Jerusalem, rather. They starve out Jerusalem to the point that people begin to take their dead and just throw them over the walls. And then when that starts happening, the Romans just plow through. They lower the walls. They lower the entire temple. They destroy it all. Many women and children die, which is why Jesus says, if you're pregnant or nursing, pray you're not there. But you know who? Very few Christians died in the destruction of the temple. Why is that? Because when the rumors of wars broke out, what did the Christians do? They didn't run into, the, into Jerusalem like the Jews did. They ran to the mountains like Jesus just told them to. And that's why there weren't that many Christians that died when the temple was destroyed. They listened to what Jesus told them to do. Finally, last set of signs, verses 24 through 27, Jesus speaks about the days after this tribulation. Now, just do me a favor. Look look at these verses with me, okay? Verses 24 through 27. Just glance at this. This doesn't sound like something that happened in 70 A.D., does it? I mean, this, this is astronomical signs. You've got the sun and the moon not shining. You've got stars falling out of the sky. You've got Jesus himself coming back. 
This sounds like what? This sounds like what's going to happen. This doesn't sound like something in 70 AD. Except, are you ready? In 70 AD, guess what there were a lot of reports of? Astronomical phenomenon. Now, this isn't in the Bible. This comes from Josephus and other historians, a guy named Eusebius and the guys like that. There, there were reports of an earthquake that sounded like a multitude of voices. There were reports of a large comet that streaked across the sky and illuminated all the sky. Josephus even says there was this great report, and he admits, he says, this sounds like a fable, and I can't explain it, but this is what people said. He said there was this report of images of chariots and soldiers running about in the clouds just before the sunset, and all of this apparently happened in 70 AD. Now, what do you do with that? I don't know. I don't know what you do with that. And it's okay that I don't know. But here's what I lean towards saying. In 70 A.D., did Jesus show up in power and glory? I think he did. I think in 70 A.D., Jesus showed up in power and glory and laid waste through the means of the Romans this horrible sacrificial system that he was done with. And then he began the process of gathering his people, gathering his elect from every corner of the world. That's why you see the gospel go out everywhere. But beloved, that was that hill. Is there yet another hill? Is Jesus coming back? I think so. I think so. Because one day Jesus is going to come again. He's going to come in power. He's going to come in glory. But he's going to lay waste to all of his enemies. And he's going to finally rescue us once and for all and bring us to himself. Now, to close, let me, let me remind you of a reminder that Jesus gives us. Look at verse 32. This is really important here at the end. Verse 32, Jesus says this. Concerning that day or that hour, no one what? No one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, not even Jesus knows, but only the Father. Jesus makes it really clear. Do we know when this is going to happen? No. No. Now, beloved, what's crazy is that today, a lot of us believers, we enamorate ourselves. We, sometimes we get so focused in on this subject of eschatology that we might actually start to scour the news Every time we hear something on TV or about politics or, or government or something like that, every time we see a new earthquake or a tsunami or something like that, or every time we hear of a new war, we might get nervous and start thinking and start doing our calculations and start trying to figure out exactly when Jesus is going to return. And all the while, as we're looking for these clues, Jesus says what? There is no clue. No one knows. And we're not meant to know. Did, did they have a clue for exactly when the temple was going to be destroyed? No. Do we have a clue for exactly when Jesus is going to return? We don't. Now that begs a question. Jesus, why didn't you just say that and not give us all these crazy signs? What's the point of the signs if we don't know when he's going to return? Beloved, the point of the signs is this. The signs don't tell you when he's going to arrive they assure you that he is going to arrive. The point of the signs is not so you can set your watch. The point of the signs is so you can assure your heart that he really is coming. He, let, remember this. He likened these signs to birth pains. Ladies, I've never had labor pains. And I don't plan to. Though in this day and age, men can be women, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> That's a joke. That was just to wake you up, all right? I, I'm never going to have labor pains. But I've heard, I've heard from women who have had labor pains that when the labor pains come, now you nod in agreement if this is true, when the labor pains come, that does not tell you exactly when the baby is coming because apparently many a woman has had the labor pains only to find out two days later that the child's finally going to arrive, Right? 
So the labor pains don't tell you when the child is coming. They only assure you that what? A child is definitely coming. Beloved, for 2,000 years, what have we experienced? Earthquakes, famines, the persecution of the church, wars and rumors of wars. And what does this all tell us? Does it tell us when Jesus is coming? No, but it assures us what? The Son of Man is going to come. That's encouraging. The next war you hear of, what do you do? Ah, this is horrible. Or, this is good. This is the Lord coming again one day. So instead of being preoccupied and worried about news headlines, Jesus, in all of chapter 13, he gives us one command. What's the one command Jesus gives us in chapter 13? Here's the end. He says this, stay awake. Stay awake is what he says. That's kind of funny to say at the end of a long sermon, okay? If, you, if you're not awake, stay awake. He says, you don't know when the master is coming, so stay awake. Now, what does it mean to stay awake? Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. I'll read this to you. Paul tells us what it means. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age waiting for our blessed hope. And what's that? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Paul, what does staying awake look like? Number one, it looks like being saved. It looks like salvation. And and I got to ask you this morning, are you awake in that sense? Do you believe and trust in Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? Listen, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ where you say, I am a sinner, I need a Savior, I cannot save myself, and I trust in Jesus, if you don't have that, your problem is not that you're not awake. The problem is you're not alive. You need to be alive before you can even be awake. So believe and trust in Christ. The next thing that, that Paul says is staying awake looks like renouncing ungodliness. It it looks like renouncing worldly passions. It it looks like living a repentant life. It looks like living self-controlled and upright and godly. And get this, Paul says, it looks like living that way right now in this present age. You, You know what staying awake does not look like? It doesn't look like saying, I'll be godly one day. I'm gonna have fun right now. I'll I'll be upright one day. I'm going to enjoy my college years. I'll be upright one day. I'm still young. No. Beloved, staying awake says, Jesus might be by my side right now. Let me not do anything that would be, make him ashamed. It means I live godly right now. I live for him right now. And finally, Paul says, staying awake looks like hopeful waiting. Waiting. For the return of Jesus. Beloved, do you get excited when you think about the return of Christ? Do do, do you get excited when you think about the fact that Jesus will come again? Or does part of you go, I hope it's not tomorrow. I'm going to Disney tomorrow. (laughs) No, are are you hopeful? Are you excited? Because listen, one day it could be, it could have been right then. We don't know. But one day, he's going to come. That's our hill of fulfillment. And for sure, as we look at all the horrible things in this life, they all prove and point to the fact he is going to come. And one day he's going to come. He's going to put all of his enemies to shame. He's going to rescue us and bring us to him finally. That day is coming. And the question is, are you awake? Are you ready? Maranatha. Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word this morning. The bulk and breadth of it. God, we ask for understanding. We ask for wisdom to understand these things. We understand that there is even blessing when we understand these things. But but Lord, more than anything, would you assure our hearts 
Make us confident in your return. Make us hopeful and joyful at seeing you again. Father, assure our hearts. Help us to live godly lives, awake and godly lives, trusting in you, living for you, repenting for you until you come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.